Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. Good evening, um, and uh, welcome to the George Morris Woodruff Class of 1857 Memorial Lecture. Um, and I really want to say welcome, everybody. I'm happy to see so many people here, particularly this, uh, this late in the semester. Uh, we've had a wonderful lineup of speakers all semester, and it's hard to believe that Thanksgiving is next week and the term is close to being over. So this is the final lecture of the semester, uh, and I am really, really delighted to introduce the Vincent Scully Visiting Professor of Architectural History and the school's current director of doctoral studies uh, and a very dear and beloved friend of mine, Joan Ackman. Um, and tonight she will be delivering, as I just stated, with this long name, the George Morris Woodruff Class of 1857 Memorial Lecture. So the Woodruff series was established in 2010 by a bequest from Mr. Woodruff's great-grandson, the late H. Allen Brooks, got his master's degree from Yale in 1955, and Brooks was an eminent historian specializing in the work of Frank Lloyd Wright and particularly relevant for tonight, Le Corbusier. For most of his long career, Professor Brooks taught at the University of Toronto, and previous Woodruff lecturers include Eve Blau, Kurt Foster, Barry Bergdahl, Kathleen James, Dr. Barty, among many other distinguished historians, and Joan, of course, it's an honor for us to be able to add you to that list. So in addition to holding the Vincent Scully Visiting Professorship and directing our PhD program, uh, Joan Ackman has taught and lectured widely around the world, uh, including teaching at the University of Pennsylvania and at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, where she was for over two decades and where she also served as the director of Columbia's Temple Hoyn Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture. She's also held teaching appointments at Harvard, at the GSD, Cooper Union, Cornell, the City University of New York Graduate Center, and the Berlage Institute in the Netherlands. Achman began her career at the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies in New York, where she was an editor of Oppositions and was responsible for the Oppositions book series. Among her many edited publications are her award-winning anthology, Architecture Culture, 1943 to 1940, 1968, excuse me, published by Rizzoli in 1993, The Pragmatist Imagination, Thinking About Things in the Making from Princeton Architectural Press in 2001, and her 2012 book, Architecture School, Three Centuries of Educating Architects in North America from MIT Press. She was honored by the American Institute of Architects for Collaborative Achievement in 2003 and named a Fellow of the Society of Architectural Historians in 2017. Tonight she will deli deliver a lecture entitled Whose Revolution on the Centennial of Lord Corbusier's Verre en Architecture, 1923 to 2023. Sorry, hard to believe that was 100 years ago. Please join me in giving Joan Ackman a warm welcome. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, it's such a pleasure uh, to be here. It's a privilege to be here, and I am so enjoying my visiting professorship. It's this is four and a half years now, and it's uh, it's been great. I could do without the Amtrak commute, <laughs> but apart from that, it uh, it's been a pleasure to get to know so many of you students and colleagues. So uh, I should tell you that the paper I'm about to present. Um, originated from an invitation that I had this past summer uh, at a, to a conference in Finland that was titled, Who's Modernism? And in trying to figure out what I was going to talk about, I realized that this is indeed the centennial of Verzun Architecture. Um, and I'm telling you this as context because uh, the, the, this question of whose modernism is interwoven into this paper. I wasn't able to get rid of it, even though I've revised the paper a lot for tonight. So anyway, we'll start with that. So whose modernism turns out to be a tricky, not to say trick, question, 
one that becomes increasingly fraught the more we reflect on it. Not only does it oblige us to consider who had an interest in modernism, who laid claim to it, who its authors and agents were, what re motivations they had, who wished modernism success and became its beneficiaries and who didn't, who wrote its narratives in the past, who writes its narratives now, and who today has a stake in preserving its legacy. Inevitably, the question sends us back to the very definition of the term modernism. Which modernism? Modernism when? Modernism where? Modernism for whom? It goes without thinking, uh, saying when we speak about modernism today that we're no longer talking about a monolithic affair. Among the variations on the theme are multiple modernisms, hybrid modernisms, other modernisms, entangled modernisms, contested modernisms, colonial modernisms, modernisms in common. Along the ideological spectrum, we encounter different intensities and flavors from avant-garde modernism to reactionary modernism, this last term coined by Jeffrey Herf to describe the volatile mixture uh, of advanced technology and conservative ideology in Nazi Germany. We find varieties of modernism in the context of disparate political and economic systems and on the agendas of different project states, to borrow a term from a recent book by the historian Charles Meyer. While many uh, of the early protagonists saw modernism as destined to become universal or at least international, uh, how does or did it differ under capitalist, communist, and social democratic systems? Are the modernisms produced under different regimes comparable? How should we understand belated and partial uptakes of modernist ideology? What about when the ascription of modernism precedes the phenomenon? Can architecture be called modernist if it's more a projection or an image, uh, a desire to be modern than an on the ground reality? Is it an accident that futurist movements uh, emerged in the early 20th century with spe special intensity in two countries Italy and Russia that were among the least industrialized in Europe uh, at the time. Is the definition of modernism necessarily bound up with development and its associated processes and experiences? If so, what's modernism's relationship to those cognate terms modernization and modernity? Don't these terms pose the same problems? When and where does the modern begin and end? Is the 20th century the golden age of modernism that's now past? And what about the fact that the term modernism is itself a retrospective uh, construction, largely coming into currency, at least in an English-speaking uh, context, after World War II, uh, and subsuming appellations like Esprit Nouveau, Modern Movement, Neues Bauen, Rationalismo, International Style. Maybe we should abandon the term altogether but what to replace it with? These questions uh, and others clamor to be answered as soon as we pose the question, who's modernism? So wading straight into this thicket of complexities, uh, I want to revisit one of the most iconic and seemingly self-evident expressions of modernist ideology, modern architecture's most canonical and celebrated manifesto a document that epitomizes what we reflexively think of when we speak about architectural modernism. To undertake yet another reading of Le Corbusier's Vers en Architecture may seem de rigueur. Yet beyond the fact that 2023 is the centennial of the publication, and what you're looking at is the cover of the first edition of the book, signed Le Corbusier Saunier, the second part uh, of the hyphenated name, referring to Le, Corbus Le Corbusier's collaborator, Amédé aux Enfants, whose name got dropped in subsequent editions. Anyway, beyond <laughs> uh, marking the centennial, there's more to reflect on, I would suggest, once we ask the question, who's modernism? To reframe our question more pointedly, who was the intended addressee of Vers une architecture? Who was Le Corbusier soliciting with his polemical book? 
And this leads to an even thornier question, and the one I'm going to dwell on tonight. Is Vers une architecture a revolutionary exhortation or a counter-revolutionary one? We all know that the book concludes with a chapter titled Architecture or Revolution and two famous last lines. Architecture or revolution, revolution can be avoided. Actually, Le Corbusier contemplated titling not just the last chapter, but the entire book, Architecture or Revolution, as you see in this sketch. Interestingly, although the title got changed, the perspectival image that is drawn above the words, a view down a long corridor uh, of the ocean liner, Aquitania, would survive onto the cover of the published version, already suggesting not so much uh, the kind of cataclysmic upheaval implied by revolution as the more incremental conception of moving toward an architecture, toward a future or new architecture as the original English mistranslation had it. And here in the original typescript, we see in Le Corbusier's handwritten edition the message the architect most wants to leave his readers with. It is possible to avoid, on peut éviter, the revolution. So what is the meaning of this either or without a question mark? Does Le Corbusier want to bring about a revolution through the instrumentality of architecture? Or does he want to stave one off? Is architecture to be an agent of change or one of stabilization? In whose interest is the latter option? Is it possible for Le Corbusier's position to be both radical and reactionary at the same time? Let me defer this last set of questions too for another moment in order to say that I'm going to sidestep contentious debates over whether Le Corbusier was a fascist. Recent scholars and biographers have made the case that a close affinity exists between Le Corbusier's avant-garde aesthetics and his attraction to fascist politics. Most recently, in 2015, in the context of a hagiographic uh, retrospective at Centre Pompidou titled Le Corbusier, Measures of Man, on the 50th anniversary of the architect's death, vituperations flew back and forth. The exhibition, devoted to Le Corbusier's vision of human proportion and how the human body should be housed, largely failed to reckon with his political involvements, ignoring his two-year dalliance from July 1940 uh, to June 1942 with the Nazi caretaker government in Vichy, not to mention his earlier collaborations in the 20s and 30s with right-wing intellectuals and avowed fascist publications. The show at Pompidou also coincided with the publication of a spate of new books drawing on recently excavated documents and personal correspondence, evincing instances of the architect's interest in eugenic theory, his recourse to anti-Semitic stereotypes in his letters, and during the war, his callous indifference to the persecution of his French countrymen who by the spring of 1942 were being deported to concentration camps. These accusations were in turn rebutted in a collection of essays uh, by leading Corbusier scholars and political historians published in 2020. In a judiciously balanced and informed older essay titled Architecture or Revolution, Taylorism, Technocracy, and Social Change, 1983, Mary McLeod, who also contributed chapter to the recent book, this book, argued that the architect's position resists being easily categorized as either left or right, despite being variously stigmatized as both. He's called both a Bolshevik and a fascist and that his efforts in the 1920s to influence urban and social policy while remaining at arm's length from actual politics were largely naive. Gravitating during the decade of the 20s to the American ideas of Frederick Taylor and Henry Ford 
on the one hand, and a Latter-day Saint Simonianism on the other, that is a vanguard cadre of technocrats, businessmen, and artists to lead society forward, Le Corbusier would be strongly shaken by the worldwide financial crisis in 1929, um, which seriously undermined the hopes he had in enlightened industrial capitalism. In the increasingly turbulent and dangerous decade of the 30s, this disillusionment would impel him, like many intellectuals from both ends of the spectrum, to entertain undemocratic and authoritarian solutions. Obviously, this explanation is an insufficient apologetic for what, on the face of it, remains troubling behavior. In any case, we cannot fail to acknowledge that the Swiss-French architect had a native predisposition toward order, hierarchy, and discipline, and not only in the symbolic realm of aesthetics or the instrumental one of building construction. But leaving adjudications of moral turpitude and political nuance to those who've delved more deeply into the matter, my present concern is to try to understand the choice that Le Corbusier presents between architecture and revolution at the end of Vers une architecture. Let's return to the question of whom he intended to address with this manifesto. As Jean-Louis Cohen traced in the introduction to the more recent English translation of the book published by the Getty in 2007, first versions of all the chapters except the last one had previously appeared in issues of the journal L'Esprit Nouveau, uh, which Le Corbusier, Corbusier co-founded and edited between 1920 and 25 with Ozenfant and up to issue 19, the poet Paul Dermay. The chapter, Architecture or Revolution, was supposed to have appear, appeared in L'Esprit Nouveau 19, but never did because the journal's publication was suspended for 18 months starting in 1922. As Cohen and others have emphasized, the book that ultimately was published in 23 uh, is deliberately experimental and unconventional in literary style, imagery, and construction. In a letter written to his parents in 1919, in which he already envisions collecting his polemical writings into a book, Le Corbusier tells them that it will be an avant-garde thing. The volume opens with a resume of the content of each of its seven chapters. The same summaries are then reiterated for emphasis at the head of each chapter. The first chapter, titled Aesthetic of the Engineer, Architecture, sets up the dialectic between technology and aesthetics. Uh, that is the book's fundamental premise. Le Corbusier lauds modern engineers for being productive members of society, healthy and virile, equipped to build, as opposed to their architectural counterparts, whom he describes as disenchanted and idle, boastful or morose. <laughs> the, att the attribution to engineers of an innate aesthetic sensibility um, that contemporary architects steeped in their academic styles lack leads to a second chapter titled Three Reminders to Architects making it clear that architects are among the principal readers to whom Le Corbusier is directing his diatribe. The third chapter, Regulating Lines, demonstrates the value of geometric proportions as a trans-historical aesthetic logic and ordering principle, introducing didactic examples from the past as well as from his own work. In the fourth chapter, Eyes That Do Not See, he returns to his opening subject, celebrating industrial production exemplified by ocean liners, airplanes, and automobiles as embodying the new spirit of modern times, its powerful implications ungrasped yet by tradition-minded architects and others. The fifth chapter, simply titled Architecture and also subdivided into three parts, takes up the aesthetic argument again, uh, but now from the perspective of architecture, as a uniquely emotional and phenomenological experience, adducing examples from the entire history of architecture, not least Parthenon, Michelangelo, 
lessons for creative architectural invention, not for slavish imitation. Finally, the two culminating chapters of the book, Mass Production Housing and Architecture or Revolution, directly concern his own time and address an expanded readership, including not only engineers, but forward-thinking intellectuals, the really active stratum of society, modern businessmen, their intelligence at the root of every initiative, and most especially, adventurous industrialists, whom the architect obviously aspires to attract as future clients. The appeal to this last constituency is made even more explicit in a publication uh, of two years later in the same L'Esprit Nouveau book series, The Almanac of Modern Architecture, which appeared on the occasion of the 1925 World's Fair in Paris and Le Corbusier's construction of his own pavilion there as a built manifesto of his ideas. The chapter on mass production housing, uh, which incorporates uh, built and unbuilt examples from his own practice, makes the case for the dwelling not only as the problem of the era, but as crucial to maintaining social equilibrium. This last argument will come to fruition in the book's final chapter, which directly broaches the relationship between architecture and historical change or revolution. Not incidentally, images of revolving and rotating machine parts, racing cars, and racing tracks accompany the text, tacitly serving as visual metaphors. But a close reading immediately reveals ambiguities. Le Corbusier begins by hailing the great transformation that's occurring in the current epoch in multiple domains, enumerating the revolutions, as he specifically calls them, that have occurred in labor, in industrial production, in big business, building construction, and finally, uh, in architecture itself. Quote, all the values have been reversed, he writes with a Nietzschean flourish. There's been a revolution in the conception of what architecture is. Yet with apparent disregard for self-contradiction, he then goes on to say that, quote, society is filled with a violent desire for something it may obtain or may not, anticipating his final salvo, that revolution is avoidable. The contradiction between exhilaration over the organizational, technological, and cultural revolutions taking place on the one hand, and fears of social upheaval on the other never gets resolved. Marx and Engels have theorized that a revolution in the mode and relations of production in one domain would inevitably bring about a, relation, a revolution in the others. Yet while bourgeois democracy was viewed by radical left and right wing intellectuals as corrupt and decrepit, to many in France, the prospect of a proletarian revolution modeled on the one that had occurred in Russia in 1917 was just as anathema. Labor was viewed as a rising and restive class, ambitious to take power, and worker alienation threatened to lead to shutdowns, paralyzing general strikes, and revolution. Already, an energized trade union movement had forced concessions from factory owners, most recently including, as Le Corbusier elaborates in his chapter, Architecture Revolution, the eight-hour workday. He writes, the eight-hour workday, three eight-hour shifts in the factory, the shifts work in relays. This one begins at 10 p.m. and ends at 6 in the morning. Another completes its work at 2 in the afternoon. What were the legislators thinking when they authorized the eight-hour day? What's a man who's free from 6 a.m. until 10 p.m., from 2 p.m. until after midnight, going to do? What becomes of the family in these conditions? The home is there to take in the human beast and welcome him. And the worker is cultivated enough to know how to put so many free hours to good use. But no, that's just it. The home is hideous. And the mind has not been educated for so, for so many free hours. So we can indeed write architecture or demoralization, 
demoralization and revolution. To Le Corbusier, then, the most viable strategies for countermanding demoralization and worse from an unhappy and obstreperous labor force appeared to be strong top-down management on the one hand and on the other equally essential reinforcement of the family unit and family <coughs> life, the most stabling, stabilizing force in society, its biological bonds now fatally weakened by an, an unnatural mode of production. I'm sure you've all read the book at some point or other. Go back, to, go back to this chapter and you'll be surprised to see how much emphasis is put on the family. It was architecture's task to advance the revolution in production while at the same time abetting domestic <coughs> harmony in the domain of re, uh, domestic harmony and order in the domain of reproduction through the palliative of beautiful, healthful, and affordable modern housing. This was industrial revolution and paternalistic counter-revolution combined. One of the immediate positive outcomes of the publication of Vers in Architecture for Le Corbusier was a commission from the industrialist Henry Fruges, initially for the design of a small housing estate in Lege near Arcachon, and then for a much larger Cité Jardin Garden City in the suburb of Pessac on the outskirts of Bordeaux to house the workers in his sugar refinery. Fruges, who owned a company that imported products from the French colonies and a sawmill to manufacture wood crates for his sugar shipments, was a recognized captain of industry in the Bordeaux region. Upon reading Vers une Architecture shortly after it appeared, he became entranced with Le Corbusier's vision and arranged to meet with him in Paris. Out of this came the 37-year-old architect's first opportunity to realize his radical ideas for mass-produced worker housing. Fruges's remit was all Le Corbusier could have dreamed of. I authorize you to put your theories into practice, however extreme the consequences might be. I would like to achieve conclusive results in a new form in inexpensive living quarters. Pesach must be a laboratory. Well, there are a number of very good studies on the relationship between modern architects uh, and their clients, including those of Le Corbusier. There's still no comprehensive book on the subject. One should be written as it would aid us in answering the question, who's modernism? Fruges was, in fact, Le Corbusier's ideal client. The two were, in many ways, kindred spirits, and their close and fruitful relationship in the second half of the 1920s would have a major impact on their respective careers. Besides his passion for modern architecture, Fruges was also a polymath with a strong amateur interest in art and music. Even more important for Le Corbusier was his genuine desire to improve his workers' lives and his adventurous disposition. In business, Fruges's personal motto was, better to fail at times with one's companies than to risk nothing. I'm not going to elaborate much on the design and construction of PESAC undertaken by Le Corbusier together with Pierre <coughs> Jeanneret between 1924 and 26. The project has been described comprehensively by architectural historians uh, Brian Brace Taylor and Tim Benton. In the second revised edition, uh, Um, in, the, in the second revised edition of Vers une Architecture, which, was, which appeared in late 1924, the project is already well illustrated um, uh, in, in the chapter on uh, mass production housing. Um, belying uh, the stereotype of, and here's uh, another plate from that chapter, belying the stereotype uh, of Le Corbusier uh, as a all white, uh, obsessed with all white architecture in the 1920s, Pessac made use of a carefully worked out scheme of exterior polychromy, 
which was specifically requested by the client and based on the quasi-naturalistic purist palette, brick red, mint green, sky blue, white, that Le Corbusier had previously developed with Ozenfant and used on the interior walls of the La Roche Genere house. At Pessac, the exterior color was meant to relieve the appearance of density and monotonous repetition in the tightly planned estate. Color was also used in the interiors, by the way. Only 53 of the intended total of 135 dwelling units got built. Le Corbusier um, ex uh, embraced his mandate to experiment with new technologies and rationalize construction while also striving uh, to, uh, to accommodate Fruges's demands for a lively and variegated environment. Based on five distinct house types, uh, differing in size and um, uh, configuration, single detached, uh, duplex, three-story, so-called skyscraper, which I'll show you in a second, a zigzag arrangement, and an arcade type, the units were organized in court according to a module of five by five, by five meters um, and five uh, by 2.5 meters and component elements and materials uh, were standardized uh, to keep down costs and facilitate efficient construction. The structural framing was reinforced concrete. Hollow infill panels were intended to be sprayed from a cement gun, uh, but difficulties with the newfangled machine, which Fruget acquired at lots of expense, caused the later built houses to use traditional cinder block. Among their modern features, uh, the dwelling units had their own garages. Let me go one more slide here. Um, even if not all workers had cars in those days. Um, indoor bathrooms, also uncommon at the time. And rooftop terraces, private uh, courtyards, uh, and other uh, garden features integrated with the overall landscaping. Yet the project quickly ran into difficulties. Construction problems, budget overruns due to Le Corbusier's exacting standards and his rejection of the quality of work performed by a local builder, refusal by banks to give mortgages for the unconventional dwellings, and the municipality's denial of permits for water lines, preventing buyers from moving in for almost three years, led to the cost of the houses ballooning to three or four times more than projected and twice as much as comparable housing on the market. The local press ridiculed the dwellings as sugar <coughs> cubes, a Moroccan village, le rigolarium de Fruges. Fruges attempted to sell the estate and walk away, but was unable to find a buyer. By 1929, the financial toll combined with the economic crisis caused the industrialists to file for bankruptcy. After liquidating his holdings in France, he moved to Tunisia and then Algeria, where he would spend the next four decades farming, painting, and composing music, returning to France only after Algeria gained independence in 1962. Meanwhile, thanks to the enactment in 1928 of the Lucher Law, a piece of legislation intended to address the national housing crisis, envisioning construction of 250,000 low-cost dwellings in the next five years. The Minister of Labor, Louis Loucher, with whom Le Corbusier had established earlier a professional relationship, was finally able to step in and save the troubled project by subsidizing loan, uh, loans to low-income buyers. Yet it was just a matter of time before another unforeseen outcome occurred. The new property owners began modifying their dwellings to better suit their taste and conform to the local vernacular. They subdivided rooms, resized window openings, enclosed, pa enclosed patios and terraces, added pitched roofs, blocked off open space around the pilotis on the ground level, changed the colors, and freely added their own embellishments. Many houses were soon rendered unrecognizable as having come from the hand of Le Corbusier. <laughs> Other houses rapidly fell into disrepair. Pessac's story became notorious after it was recounted by Philippe Boudon, 
a French architect, in a book of 1969. Written 40 years after the fact, one year after the explosions of 1968 in Paris, eight years after the publication of Jane Jacobs' Death and Life of Great American Cities, to which Boudon alludes in passing, and in the heyday of a new grassroots advocacy movement in architecture, the book, translated into English in 1972 as Lived in Architecture, is an attempt to present an open-minded and objective socio-architectural account of what had transpired. Prefaced with a short statement by the philosopher Henri Lefebvre, it traces the settlement's early history and reception before devoting the remainder of its pages to photographs and interviews with owners of various houses. Boudon also inserts uh, in the book a number of extracts from contemporary newspaper articles and other documents, notable among them a lengthy excerpt from an article by Dr. Pierre Winter, published in September 1926, the only detailed and well-informed appraisal of Pessac that Boudon was able to find in the course of his research. As Boudon notes, Winter was a leading member of the FESO, a far-right party named after Mussolini's Italian fascisti. His article on Pessac appeared in the party's newspaper, Le Nouveau Siec. Also a prominent physician, Winter effusively praises Le Corbusier's scheme for its innovative and healthful architectural and environmental features, describing the provision of modern hygienic housing as a matter of greatest urgency for the coming fascist state. Winter, who had earlier, uh, had, had earlier struck up a friendship with Le Corbusier after prevailing upon him to take up a regular regimen of physical exercise, especially basketball. Uh, and he also contributed an article to L'Esprit Nouveau 15 titled Le Corps Nouveau, The New Body, um, touting the essential benefits of sports and recreation for modern citizens. During the 1930s and into the war years, he and Le Corbusier would collaborate on additional publications, including this one, published in 1942 during the Vichy period, with Winter's contribution, The Point of View of the Biologist, uh, and two accompanying articles by Le Corbusier, one of them pseudonymous, this one under the pseudonym Paul Boulard, um, in which this tree that you see um, uh, sinks its roots, uh, the roots of the French nation into the region, the family, and <coughs> local industrial, artisanal, uh, and agricultural production. Well, I said I wasn't gonna talk about Le Corbusier uh, and the fascist um, moment, but I just did. Call it a footnote. <laughs> okay. As for uh, Le Corbusier's own response to the Pessac residence alterations to his scheme, Boudon quotes the architect as having had the good grace to say, it's always life that is right and the architect who is wrong. Of course, it's possible to read this statement more sardonically, as elsewhere Le Corbusier expressed not a little bitterness about what had befallen his architecture. Thus, Le Corbusier's assertion, revolution can be avoided, received a twist at Pessac, with the inhabitants literally taking things into their own hands, exercising bottom-up agency. As for Le Corbusier's belief in the possibility of avoiding revolution through architecture, it might arguably, if a little perversely, be seen as a textbook in, uh, instance of the theory of repressive desublimation later elaborated by Herbert Marcuse. I say perversely because in the case of the housing at Pessac, the architect and client were undoubtedly well-intentioned. But while both saw innovative technology and the latest domestic equipment as having positive uh, and a, a positive and progressive effect on the inhabitants of their modern garden city, Pessac was, after all, designed to be a company town. Repressive desublimation, according to the Frankfurt School philosopher's definition, 
is the satisfaction of the needs of workers in an advanced industrial capitalist society at a lower level than is actually necessary to liberate them from their drudgery and oppression in the workplace. In the post-World War II uh, era uh, in which Marcuse was writing, uh, we might think of Betty Friedan's Happy Housewife literally sold a bill of consumer goods to keep her living docilely with her kids in her suburban tract house. Despite the very different context, Le Corbusier's argument on behalf of workers' housing in the 20s as a device for creating social harmony has a similar logic and in the end is no less conservative. As the Frankfurt School philosopher puts it in his book, Counter-Revolution and, and Revolt, 1972, the creation of pacified subjects is inherent in capitalism's mode of operation. He writes, capitalism reorganizes itself to meet the threat of a revolution, which would be the most radical of all historical revolutions. The highest stage of capitalist development corresponds in the advanced capitalist countries to a low of revolutionary potential. The further vicissitudes of Le Corbusier's housing scheme in the aftermath of Boudin's book are recounted by the sociologist Anita Enye in an essay titled Transformation Unwanted, Heritage Making and Its Effects in Le Corbusier's Pessac Estate, 2014. Indebted to Pierre Bourdieu, the essay is a close analysis of Pessac as it is today being restored back to its original architectural condition. Inquiring into, quote, how and by whom the making of heritage has been managed at Pesach, how the social structure and the perception of the residents have changed in the course of this symbolic upgrading, and how the residents react to the practices and rules of monument conservation and to the efforts of making the estate part of a world heritage site she offers a sharp critique of the reflexive preservation strategy of returning a historical work of architecture uh, to in the uh, 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 sorry of returning a historical work of architecture to a condition true to the original, thereby erasing the traces of its intervening history in the interest of vindicating the intention of a famous architect. Um, I uh, can't add much to what she has to say about the aesthetic reconquest of Pesach, except to note that at the time she was writing, World Heritage Site designation was still pending. As of 2016, Pesach, together with 16 other buildings and sites designed by Le Corbusier, located in seven countries and four continents, were inscribed in UNESCO's World Monuments list affording them permanent protection and prestige. In the, in the post-COVID era, the marketing of PESAC by the local authorities and their associated team of architectural historians and experts, appointed arbiters of authenticity, have now transformed the housing estate into a lively site of heritage tourism. One may speculate as to what Le Corbusier himself would make of this transformation were he around to see it. Pesach is indeed an example of a new urbanism, although not the one he had in mind. The irony of maintaining fidelity to Pesach's original architectural features <laughs> while dissociating them from the ideas he expounded in Vers d'une Architecture, ideas, ideas shared by his client, returns us to the questions we posed initially. Whose modernism? Whose revolution? A modernist revolution benefiting whom? And brings me to my last three slides. The title of the last chapter of Bears in Architecture bears a fortuitous similarity to that of a pamphlet issued in 1899 by Rosa Luxemburg. Luxembourg was a Polish-German economist, a political theorist, and a revolutionary socialist. 
Her pamphlet was a rejoinder to Eduard Bernstein, her colleague in the SPD, the German Social Democratic Party, who had taken a revisionist position with respect to Orthodox Marxism in 1891 at the Erfurt Congress, where the, partly codif where, where the party codified the political program to which it would adhere up to World War I. In a revision of Marxist doctrine, Bernstein had argued that it was no longer necessary for the SPD to militate for the overthrow of capitalism in order for the working class to prevail in its struggle. Instead, he asserted, through collaboration with the party in power, legislative reforms could be enacted that would lead to political form reforms and ultimately to capitalism's demise. In her pamphlet, Luxembourg sternly replied that not the reform of capitalism, but the fully conscious realization of socialism it, uh, must remain the party's unwavering goal. The choice Luxembourg presents in social reform or revolution is unambiguous. In an existing capitalist society, in a society in which the relations of production are controlled by capital, reformist compromise is not just counter-revolutionary, but self-defeating. In fact, the resemblance between the two titles may not be entirely fortuitous. In 1919, 20 years after the pamphlet's publication, Luxembourg and her comrade, Karl Liebknecht, launched an insurgency known as the Spartacus Uprising in protest against the coalition social democratic government of the newly founded Weimar Republic. The two activists were brutally murdered in the streets of Berlin by government troops acting together with right-wing proto-Nazi paramilitaries. Their assassinations at the chaotic dawn of the Weimar era had a traumatic impact across Europe, heightening fears of left-wing extremism and further spread of violence. Beginning to write Verzun Architecture at this time, Le Corbusier could hardly have been unmindful of an event that would become indelibly lodged in Europe's collective memory, and that inevitably helped to spur his and other intellectuals' calls for a return to order, a retour à l'ordre, by the mid-1920s. Today, a century after the publication of Le Corbusier's manifesto, a half century after the retrenchments that followed the events of 68, and three decades after the fall of the Berlin Wall, our evocation of revolution and counter-revolution may seem untimely. But I'll conclude with a reminder to architects that we find ourselves today in the throes of yet another technological revolution, an electronic and information revolution no less sweeping in its social political and architectural implications than the one Le Corbusier exhorted his professional colleagues and vanguard cohort to follow him into a century ago. And if communism no longer stirs fears of proletarian revolution in most places, it is, ironically, capitalism that today has proven to be the most revolutionary force in the world for change, an engine of incessant creative destruction. Capitalism's convulsions have created new forms of uh, inequality and disruption, new types of exploitation, new social and political conflict. The new esprit nouveau of technocratic managerialism, worker precarity, and neoliberal administration that has triumphed in our post-industrial global digital capitalist world is the latter day successor to, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the industrial age aspirations of Le Corbusier and his dream client from Bordeaux. What this suggests is that the question without a question mark of the last chapter of Vers une architecture continues to be a conundrum. Thanks.
Interesting. Great. Um, thank you so much uh, for the wonderful and deeply incisive um, presentation. I guess I have a lingering thought that kind of was running throughout the entirety um, of, of the duration of the session where, and this is something that's particularly apparent when you raised the example of Rosa Luxemburg in comparison to Le Corbusier's own trajectory where I was just thinking that Corbusier didn't die for his craft. Le Corbusier didn't really pay for his craft or ideology in such a way. He has been accused of many things, but I think at this present moment, for as much problematization exists of us understanding his complexity and his legacy's complexities, Le Corbusier is very much remaining enshrined in the context of a canon. And I just want to maybe surface a query on the idea of Le Corbusier not as revolutionary or counter-revolutionary or as an a-revolutionary an, uh, an a revolutionary thwarted technocrat. Yes. And I'm just really curious as to to what extent did, for example, Le Corbusier ever think beyond the totalizing forces of his theories, because I thought it was particularly elegant when you were talking about how Fruget, in the wake of his financial ruins, immediately packed up and moved to the French colonies, and then only returned when the colonies were no longer colonies, which were surprisingly recent um, um, occurrences. So there's a presumption embedded there of a certain kind of universal dweller, ideal person that you have also touched on. So I'm really curious about that trajectory as it emerged. Yeah, everything Thank you. you said is, is right on and very insightful. Um, I, I cited Mary Cloud's reading, um, and she insists that he was basically apolitical, although in the 30s, as things got more and more uh, just difficult in that decade, um, trying to get his, his skyscraper, his project for Algiers built. That's what he was especially doing. Um, so he was also opportunistic. Um, but he also flirted with uh, the Mussolini. Uh, and so he's a complex man. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and you know, it, it's, it's hard to pigeonhole, pigeonhole, pigeonhole him. Uh, and, and even you know, to assign Hi, thank you for your lecture. Um, I'd be curious to know from our vantage point in 2023, whether you see 100 years of Le Corbusier as 100 years of accelerated climate change and in commemorating him and the contingent material choices that he made with commemorating climate change. Well, um, you know, this kind of very much. 
Hi, Joan. Thank you for, for a great talk. Um, I'm curious about, so maybe there's an ethos in this talk that I'm wanting to have you draw out a little bit, which is the potential to take Le Corbusier um, in, in the sort of complicatedness that you talked about and maybe propose a more deflationary history of Le Corbusier, one that doesn't treat him as a great architect, but as a one who's struggling with the same questions we're all struggling with all the time. Like, how, how can we write a history that is much more about, he's just, he's, he's apolitical in some ways, he's political in other ways, where he's just struggling through these things, and how that might be a way of writing a history of a currently canonical figure that could help undo the canon in some way of uh, uh, thinking about, there's no, there's no good or bad or right or wrong, but so much as a, we have to work through it. And I think that's the, the provocation of the return to the end chapter, where we don't have an answer, we never will. But I think you're proposing a, a very an ethos of history that I'm curious about hearing more of. Look, he's a very complex figure, and you know uh, the, the canon. You know, it's not a matter of uh, either having it or getting rid of it. Uh, it it's a matter of, of you know dealing with it critically, learning more, understanding more about his positions, contextualizing them, understanding them in time, uh, doing micro history. Of learn from the people's adjustments to his architecture at Isaac? So uh, thank you, Joan. That was really wonderful. Uh, great lecture, and also um, thank you for everything you've done for the school. Um, before I move on to uh, the reception, which will be our last one of the semester, and the drink, I do actually want to pause somewhat seriously for a minute to remember uh, two important individuals in our small world of architecture. Uh, who died recently. Uh, one is longtime Yale professor Kent Bloomer, uh, who died on October 22nd. Uh, we will be celebrating his life of design and teaching with an event in the spring. And the other is dear friend uh, Tony Vidler, a leading historian and theorist 
who died on October 19th. Fiddler taught at many schools. He deaned at a few schools, and he contributed mightily to architectural discourse. Um, he served here at Yale, so the timing for this is right, as the Vincent Scully visiting professor, and also once upon a time gave a Woodruff lecture. So to both of those accomplished educators and architects, just a brief moment. So in the light of chilly weather tonight, Andrew has created a hot cocktail um, and relates to a little bit of our political discussion, a heated debate in Ward 8, it is called. It contains uh, rye, lemon, orange, and some very helpful hot water. Um, and it's actually based on a historic cocktail, so appropriate for tonight as well, that had some political leanings at a local level. It was called the Ward 8. Uh, devised in 1898 to, I'm not sure, celebrate an election or foment a revolution. You'll know when you taste it. Um, <laughs> it's, um, but the heated debate in Ward 8 just makes it more suited to drinking up on the balcony. So we'll see you up there. Grab your coat on your way up. And if you're not drinking tonight, uh, we have uh, hot chocolate with marshmallows. So see you upstairs. <laughs>